an erection. A huge... Get out of my face. If there's one truth in the cosmos, one cosmic truth, the truth is... And get out of my face. Get out of my fucking face. Invitation, but after watching some of your YouTube video... I don't think I would fit into the swimming pool very well. Hmm. wonder why he says that. Again, thanks for the invitation and good luck in your creative endeavors. Sincerely, Michael Aquino. Oh, not every day you uh, get a letter from Michael Aquino. Uh, yeah. Oh, all right. How you doing? Anthropos here with another exciting episode of You Don't Know. You don't know, huh? So don't act like you do. The 
And so, uh, we're doing a we're doing a bottle deal today instead of a, a can. Oh, welcome! I did wrong. <laughs> welcome to another exciting episode of You Don't Know. You don't know, huh? So don't act like you do. Back by popular demand in the studio today from the East Coast, we have America's original super soldier, John Storm. John, are you with me? Yes, I am. All right, man. But I think I got this form in this barrel in a cancer somehow the same way Pi did and Dr. Turner did for the same reason. I understand, and I and I wouldn't doubt that at all. And now I don't know if his name was Hugo Chavez, but the president uh, of uh, Bolivia uh, a number of years ago, he he was the one who got up at the United Nations and and when President George Bush and he said, you know, something about Satan, you know, like just comparing, you know, he's 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 the he's the he's the indigenous guy that made it as president. I'm I mean, not I'm not he's, sure he's about fake. that. I'm not sure about that, but I know that, uh, and I hope I'm even saying the wrong, the right yeah, guy. I might have the wrong country too, you know. Well, uh, uh, Venezuela is also heavily anti-American, as far as their government and stuff. Venezuela and Bolivia are the really the as far as I know. Now you and you probably know more about this uh, geopolitical stuff than I do, especially. Yeah, yeah, I, I I've remembered. Yeah, most. Generally, when I'd have to be down in some place like that, I was generally I, I was part of a crew. For one, there was more. There was me and what we called the Disney tunes. We just call ourselves the tunes, but that was our designation along with our call signs. And, and you know, we were basically CIA contractors. I, I was full MK Ultra from little baby boy. Uh, um, but uh, there'd be a team of us there, and we'd be like maybe a documentary crew or something. So I'd be carrying lots of camera bags and stuff. You know, you see a big, tall, blonde gringo around at, uh, uh, intimidating enough to, you don't want to fuck with them, at least not without lots of weapons and many friends. And that's, well, people that kind of in the know or have some idea who you are or what you are or a little exposure to, you know, our spooks and stuff, they, they know. You know, yeah, and uh, of course, gives you a little bit of elbow space. You mm -hmm. know. All right, and you know it, it's fascinating because, uh, as I'm sure you know, may, you know, depending on which South American country, but like for instance, particularly in Peru, where you know you have very, uh, you know, the people are very sturdy and very, uh, you know, you got some really manly men, but I mean they're very, uh, all, all in all, very short people. In other words, oh I'm, yeah, I'm I'm a big guy over there. You know, I'm five foot eight. You know, and I'm a big guy over there. You know. Yeah. So. And the thing that interests me most about, I, I got some friends in Peru and that, and they're talking about the Nordicos in the kind of hollow mountains. We had something similar in Sh uh, uh, allegedly in Mount Shasta, actually, you know, uh, uh, some things you can't take back. You always have to remember it's equally important to understand when not to hit, when not to kill, when not to injure, uh, uh, you know, uh, I found it useful. It makes life easier afterwards. The right. repercussions Let, let's, of a violent encounter. Yeah. You know, they kind of come for a long time and sometimes after a long time unexpectedly. You know, when you've lived this long, you've seen it, you've lived it, you've heard the old timers talk about it. And it's kind of like, I warn you, young guys, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind all the time. For an ultra, the, the one time that you are not fully aware of your surroundings is usually recorded as your time of death. And I would warn anybody else, even considering such a thing, keep that in mind. Yeah. Always. Yeah. You can be lucky. You can be good. You can be good and lucky. But I've seen even some of the best well, I, people I didn't expect to, you know, figure it out would outlive me. Uh, uh, um, you know, anything can happen, and it always does. That's right. Now, let me ask you on these, um, and because I, I don't know the names of these Oriental, uh, you know, weapons, but you know, of course, I've seen karate moves and stuff. But yeah, no, I naturally. Okay, I could describe any one you want to. Well, I, I, like. I make my own deals, like out of steel cape, like steel rope, wire rope, like that they sell at the hardware okay. store. You know, and I have a swage tool, so I make different deals, and I put it 
a weight on there. But now, is the is the object for the weight to hit them in the head to stun them? Um. Well, yeah, a good good stunning device work, 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 works good, but uh, I would use something smaller and more compact. For me, there was what uh, they used to call a yawara. Uh, let me grab this here a minute. It's, this is not a yawara, but it would be very much like one, mm -hmm. uh, uh, holding it as such. I, I am. I got to get some contrast here. Uh huh. So, can, so that's like a uh, fist. Actually, this is a switchblade, but used as such rather than as a blade banging to the hard parts, even soft parts of the body, to the temple. Now, there's a good stunning thing. Now, there's other side, there's a point. You can break bone easily, you know, or break glass, safety glass, stuff like that. Very handy little tool. But the priest lightning bolt was hardly anything more than a little carved piece of wood, about six inches long, little knobs on the end and stuff like that. You look, and it's a religious device, but it's the Chinese name for it is a priest's lightning bolt. And why would you call it that? Because he's got it in his hands. He's walking down the street praying. You think you're going to push this veggie eater over? All of a sudden, you get whacked upside the temple. Your head explodes like a freaking pumpkin. What happened? He called down lightning on you or what? He used the priest's lightning bolt. The druids used to have what they called the serpent's egg. It was a, 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 basically a stone, basically shaped like an egg. Sometimes they carve it and, and put runes and, and, and charms on it. But essentially, that little stone could instantly be your salvation with a brigand, a bandit, or even a full-blown knight giving you a bunch of shit. Because most of the knights and everything, the best, learn their martial arts from the druids themselves. And their weapons were usually simple. Uh, a sickle with a chain. Ninja in the East used that. That's called uh, uh, a, a kama, the, the, the sickle deal at uh, Kama Kusari. And then there's the uh, Manri Kusari. That's the weighted chain. Uh, it can also come out of the end of the staff where the one end is anchored in the staff or the bamboo. And the other end with the weight slides out. And you could take your staff and swing it and snatch a sword or a gun out of somebody's hand, snatch it around their neck, yank really freaking hard and don't stop. And you quietly take somebody out that maybe would be too far to reach just with your hands or to get that much closer on. That you could do it from a rooftop and snag them like that. Uh, you make it strong enough and you can give it a good yank. And like I say, you know, stunning where I've used this professionally, we don't knock out the guards. I wouldn't think of knocking out the guards. I'd think of something that would make sure the guards would never get up again and be any threat to anybody, especially me and my crew. You know, uh, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta think, you gotta plan like that. Uh, uh, when, when, when you move and that's how we successfully came back time after time. These are the things in particular I'd like to share a lot of uh, because as this police state crap gets worse and worse and people say, well, you can't be armed, you got to register. Look, I'd never ask for permission and I'd never give it away that I had one or that I have many or I have just about anything you can imagine and things most people wouldn't imagine to protect myself with the feds that monitor the place, pretty sure of that. It's good. It sends the wind up, but they give us some, some elbow space. It's kind of like you want elbow space. Don't be overtly publicly threatening where they can just haul up and shoot you like a mad dog. No, 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 no. But be at least understood to be serious enough where they fear enough for their own life. Evil preys upon the weak because it fears the strong. If they always believe you to be at a strong point, they will give you a wide berth. They're going to watch you. They're going to record you. They're going to do all kinds of things. But you got you buy yourself that much elbow room. You know, where yeah. I had to come from being born into it and getting out of it and having the, the whole thing after me. You guys, not so much, but it's going to get to that. And you really need to hone. 
And if you don't have those skills and you make that mistake in the wrong place, the people you're protecting and that are going to suffer even more. You should have been for nothing. Yeah, you got you got to, you got to project you got to project that uh, that projection of strength. Right. The one never let them see you sweat. You know. Uh, in fact, you know the spooks like the. You know, I, I don't think you get it enough. Like to say, you know, when it comes to torture, everybody talks, and it's kind of like, and everybody does, even I do, but. Pay attention. While I'm being tortured, I talk. I talk. I'm not right away. No, 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 no. You really got to convince me. And I'm not a pushover. Never was, never will be. But I'll sit there. And when it gets to the point where I have to talk, let's say you're asking me, you're interrogating me now. Or, you know, now let's say you're at a spot and let's say your compadres are to the south of you. Moving up to this particular position, you're actually the point man, and they got you, all right? Uh, uh, but they don't know for certain which way you came from and which way, and if there's, if there's reinforcements and which way they're coming from. So they're going to interrogate you. They're going to do everything they can, inflict any kind of pain on you to, to give it to you. Now, they're watching you closely. That's why they shine the lights in your face and they, they, they you know, it's not just to cover up who they are, but it's to see your reaction every time they say something, whether you're telling the truth or not. So I'm not going to tell you which way they're coming from. Are they coming from the, uh, 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 from the south? I'm not telling you anything. Are they coming from the west? I'm not telling you anything. Are they coming from the east? Watch my eyes. I'm not telling you anything. Are they coming from the north? I'm not telling you anything. Ah, it's the east. He twitched, micro expressions, uh, twinges, blood pressure jumping up, something, you know, you make it happen in the wrong place. You say the right, the, you know, give them the right information in the wrong place in the wrong day. Because, see, that's how your government has been leading us all up the garden path for decades. You know, just enough truth and more than enough bullshit. And they're never responsible for anything they say. Not anymore. Used to be, but now they made laws against suing them and them being responsible or even having to show up when they're subpoenaed. Who gets that? <laughs> Man. They've just been subpoenaed for a felony. Eh. I, I'm sorry. It, why exactly is it uh, somebody hasn't come, knocked down your door, shot your dog <clears throat> in front of your kids, and dragged your silly off as off for a nice tangerine jumpsuit, you know, crotch binding, stainless steel uh, accessories, you know? Mm -hmm. Why isn't that? What's different about that than right here? You know, and that's obvious. You know? But the rest of the world wants to close their eyes, put on their blinders, and that's not real. This is a conspiracy theory. Oh, it's a conspiracy part is absolutely correct. Through and through, there's nothing that's not dog shit dirty from one end to the other. It's had hundreds, decades, where basically the people that spout back, you, you don't get educated, you get indoctrinated with propaganda. The people that spout that back on the SATs verbatim are the ones that get the highest numbers and go to the best colleges and get the best you know, captains of the the industry, the politics, and everything else. So it's the people that is the most conditioned to this illusion. The least it's original. The least original. Yeah. Not an original thought in their heads. I'm getting that poor connection sign again, so just kind of be wary. At, uh, uh, um, what? Uh, how, well, many, how many, John, this brings up a very interesting, you know, question. Uh, and let's just talk about you know one situation where uh, you've been captured behind enemy lines and tortured. And uh, yeah. which which what would be one country where that happened? <laughs> Actually, it was within the, the 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 borders of three countries where the the, the last nastiest one actually happened. Uh, we were on a uh, well, it was a hit. 
exactly how it was going to go down, we weren't absolutely sure. We were prepared to either go in shooting or if it was possible, me and a couple's in discreetly and just taking out the, the head honcho. Depending on who they were, you have to be politically discreet. All right. Uh, 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 plausible deniability. It's kind of like the commandment number one, you know, uh, 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 of your God, the government. Um, we were in the area, come down south through Mexico, where Mexico, Belize and Guatemala all kind of joined together. It's it's a it's kind of like a smuggler's paradise, because at any given point, the federales chasing you. You, you've got like two different countries that you can just practically step across the border into. It's not like you can just step across and go, nah, 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 nah. they'll shoot your ass if they can see you. Right. <laughs> you know, but it makes it more difficult for anybody to chase you, anybody to coordinate chasing you. And we were down looking for a specific group. And um, somewhere in the course of things, I used to be what the CIA used to determine as a, they, they, they call you an outrider. Uh, kind of like a point man, but an outrider kind of circles the group, all right? There's the, there's the attack group, and there's the outrider. I'm kind of like the radar in the jungle or anywhere else we are. I'm constantly circling and watching and checking the perimeters, even as we're moving, all right, uh, uh, or, or moving forward. And, uh, you know, everything is done a lot by extreme stealth. You know, when we're not dressed as and carrying camera gear, we're you know, we're working and serious and nobody's going to see us as little as possible. As it turns out, I have friends that from Central and South America that know exactly what we're talking about. You know, uh, a friend was sharing some of this with a with a friend who deals books in Buenos Aires and and it's kind of like she's she's telling him about some of this stuff, and he, he's he's going like, and, you know, he's not surprised, and it's kind of like he doesn't even do internet, you know, no, 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 that's kind of what, you know, they're known for it, <laughs> you know, uh, our our government has been known for this, not just me, but there are myriads of other teams doing probably the same thing. Right. Uh, uh, Destabilizing uh, uh, little villages and so. What now? What? What about Subcomandante Marcos? You've heard of him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, but that's more more recent than than then. You gotta remember, I was most active back then between you know the the early to mid seventies. By seventy eight, uh, my last I had run my last mission. It went south before I. It went south a couple times before I even got to it, and nobody but us was supposed to know it, and George H.W., you know, uh, 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 and, you know, we got down, my last mission with them, my last active mission was going to be, and it was just two of us, it was me and one other partner, it wasn't a hit, it was going to be go in and steal something that these two big shots were supposed to be trading back and forth. And when this one, kind, there was a bit of mistrust, but they were getting together. And if we took this and he made excuses, this whole thing would kind of fall apart. So it was kind of the purpose of what we were sent down for. So this wasn't going to be go in guns blazing. Nobody really needed to die, but, but or we didn't think so. Uh, uh, but, uh, we, a lot of these jobs would come through like Soldier of Fortune magazine back then. This is, like I said, the 70s, uh, uh, around 70, around 78. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to take this job down there. It's down in the area of Monterey, uh, uh, Mexico, you know, more towards the Gulf than, than the West part. Um, and uh, we headed down, we were going to meet in uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. There was a specific motel set up for us, motel room waiting for us, and we'd share the room and we'd meet there, we'd get more of the information from there uh, uh, that we needed, uh, decide how we were going to cross the border and what style. Back then they called us black boys. Generally you avoided any kind of checkpoints, you didn't carry ID, you didn't have labels in your underwear or nothing that anybody could trace you with. 
Again, plausible deniability being the reason why the government would contract you to do the job if it whatever. Easy to deny everything, you know. So we go in, you know, we got to, we were pulling into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We ended up meeting in a restaurant that we usually stop at and met with others at. Decent place, good food, nothing, nothing ominous or anything else. There's a lot of family people there. So we had met there. We drove to the motel. And just as we were driving to the motel and we get within a block, we noticed there's flames coming out of one section of it. This is one of those single-story motel-type deals, lots of different you know, rooms like that, you know, side by side, like not a fantastic place, but not a bad, not a flea bag either. Uh, uh, um, the fire department was there. Now, the technique used back then was somebody, I'm, th- I'm saying mafiosa spook, all right, mm-hmm. put a light bulb filled with gasoline mm-hmm. in the lamp. In the, in the motel room, maybe a couple or several. But when the maid went in to make sure, as we were going to be coming soon, to make sure everything was, was ready for us, you know, the mint was on the pillow or whatever, and at, uh, she turned on the light, ba-boom, she was the only victim. But that was meant for us. Yeah. So, you know, we were thinking this is not an accident. Now we're paranoid, but we got a job to do and we're going to get paid good to do it. At, uh, and, it and it seems like a good thing to do, considering what the kind of events that it will cause, you know. So I kind of into it. But at the same time, now I'm spooked. All right. Just because of that, that blew the whistle. So we got real sneaky, did our little wetback thing across the across the river and, you know, get into Mexico. We made arrangements with people and contacts we've had for ages, you know, to get here, there without, you know, too much fanfare. We get up to the Monterey area. We kind of go on foot. We get up into the rocks near the Badlands, near the spot where this hacienda was. All right. Nice big place. Uh, pretty white kind of stucco adobe type thing, red tile roofs, very pretty. And in the back, they got this kind of a low white stucco wall like and um, what you call topiaries, these hedges and bushes all trimmed to look like animals and things. These guys had a lot of money. Right. Uh, uh, all right. So we're watching from the rocks, just kind of casing the place, kind of thinking, OK, what way are we going to use to get in there? And while we're watching, we're going to watch for hours. We're going to be very patient and, and, and everything. Actually, after it gets dark, I'm in the night suit and I'm getting closer and I might do the job tonight or I might just get enough information to see if I need more. Uh, it's kind of the way I approach this. It's why I get 100 percent, you know. Uh, while we're watching, a tall, shaggy blonde guy wearing all black just comes walking out of the freaking desert with his hands in his pockets, just strolling along like he's taking a freaking walk. And we're like, who's that? I don't know. He must live there at the Hacienda. As he gets up close, out of the topiaries comes gunfire, and out of a section over here comes more gunfire, like at right angles to each other. And this guy is caught in the middle, and we could see the flashes from the guns. There's a lot of guns all shooting on this guy and he's jerking and you can see the bits of clothing and stuff flying off him and and these guys step out of the bushes and stuff and they are still loading reloading and shooting this guy until he looks like a like like a like a like like about 200 pounds of hamburger just laying on the ground there I, i didn't get that close but they shot up his face and shot up his hands. And that's kind of a, that was a KGB thing. Well, spooks do it too. And things that we'd be expected to do, but the cleanup squad would do. If they come, they find your body and they're not going to take it with them. They shoot up. They didn't do DNA things back then. They'd shoot up your fingers, your hands, and your teeth. So dental records or fingerprints couldn't be used to identify you. So, I mean, they shot this guy. And this guy looked, at least from the distance, he looked like me. All right. And and I can be kind of casual and, and cool. And it's kind of like and I'm not really bluffing. I know where my aces are. Yet, you know, I, I just kind of explain that and you know, sh- showed that with, you know, with, you know, in that picture where I'm standing, you don't see any weapons. 
Nobody's supposed to. I'm going to walk into a club and I'm going to dance and shake my ass and nothing's going to fall out of my pants or my sleeves or anything like that. It's all in there. Very nice, secure and actually more familiar than your high school ring. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, who was this guy? How did, how did he, were, were they, they buried him? Well, what happened after that, that all right, blew the mission. We just turn around after that. It's like, it's done. And, and, uh, my partner went his way. I went my way. Actually, I went and I bought this Greyhound bus ticket back then where you could ride for two weeks anywhere in the continental U USA. You just kind of show it and get on, you know, so you can get on this bus, get on a bus going another way, get on a bus going another way, go back to the place you were. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You just got to travel and bounce and move and keep going. And I did that for a couple of weeks as I was getting information as to what the hell was going on that on there during that time, they had sent somebody had sent an envelope with a with a with a with an obituary out of a Mexican newspaper. They had my name in it. And it's kind of like, it wasn't me, but how did you know my name when I never I didn't even have ID? That wasn't me for one. I was there and saw it and left as quietly as I came in and then kept disappearing for, for, for weeks after that all over the freaking country until I got, and then I showed up at the contract house for payday. And of course there was no payday cause I really didn't complete the contract, but I had to see the look on their face when I showed up to allegedly get paid. And it kind of said, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like at this point on, Anybody comes and, you know, we're not friends. I, you know, we're, I, we're done. It's over. I'm not going to give you a third or fourth chance to kill me. It's it. You know, uh, uh, and I will defend myself with my life. You know I'm hostile. Uh, and, well, they did send somebody after that, but they sent them to the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, they found me. But the problem was, is we were in Mexico. And... Uh, and they were, they had their badges and their guns and they, and absolutely no permission to actually be working or doing doodly squat in Mexico. So when they threatened me, I left all that stuff on them. They got found. What the hell is the CIA doing in here? And wow, what a political snafu that was. And it was kind of like, okay, this is how you get elbow room. Get them. Because anything could happen. I'll twist things around. I will manipulate. Like I say, I like to attack from more than one way at a time. No, the one, you know, there's, there's things that you can set up, things you can manipulate. You know, uh, I remember one guy, well, this was in a, somebody tried to rob a store I was managing. And uh, he had a gun up to my head, but he was close. All right. He was, you know, he was. He was, that gun wasn't that far from my face. And, you know, uh, uh, but it was like, as he's talking to me, I'm looking now, now in a slapstick comedy, what would you do to get him to look away? Oh, your shoe's untied. Well, obviously he's not going to fall for something like, like that. Or look at that over there. No, he ain't going to fall for nothing like that. What I did is I tried to act cool and cagey. Well, I'm cool anyway. And cagey with him, I kind of looked. At one point, all I did was glance while he was looking at me. He has to be looking at you, you know, and just a quick glance over his shoulder and a slight smile. Turn up, you know, and just look back like, I didn't see a thing. And he's got to. And he just flicked his eyes this way. My hand pushed the gun this way. The other hand went right into the hollow of his throat. He was you know, gun or no gun, it really, you have to learn to, it, it, man, your life depends that it doesn't matter to you. <laughs> if you're going to die, go out swinging. But try to do it right, efficiently. Let the other guy do the dying, you know. You don't go to, you know, these idiots try to program you to go die for your country and the ultras to try to take their own lives after something. And it's kind of like, no. If you're an efficient warrior, you go to make the other guy die for what he believes in. That's the way, that's the only way it really works. Because then you get to be the son of a bitch writing about what happened instead of the other guy. 
<laughs> so you gave him a knife hand or a spear hand to the throat? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, exactly that. These two fingers and that is it's braced. Uh, uh, if I did it with one hand, the technique in Chinese kempo is called dart. Uh, it's a it's a circular move, you know, block strike. But in this case, it was I kept his hand up and away. In case he twitched, he didn't fire the gun. If he did fire the gun, it would have went up into the ceiling and away from me. That uh, you know, that bought me that split second. And you don't go, gee, what do I do next? No, it has to be one move. All right, it's it's not one two, it's one. You know, and fights over. That's why you know, it's like, well, I'm going to take on a guy. You're taking on an assassin. It's not going to be a thirty minute fight. You get close enough to kill with anything I got. You're gone. You don't get to hit me. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, you might as well do the little twirly whirly dance in the parking lot before you get to me, because that's all anybody's going to see. That's cool. That's right, man. And, <laughs> and you, you can be a, you can be a, a better fighter than I am, but that don't matter. I'm a goddamn killer. You know what I mean? There's fucking there's a difference. Right. A killer's going to approach that that fool that that was the fastest gun in the West syndrome in the parking lot. You know was just playing the wrong way. I could have equally have killed him or anything or crip crippled him. Well, he could have got a concussion, but I mean, he's trying to kick me up, kick an old man upside his head. I mean, really? You yeah. know, but do you need to call a cop after that? No, I didn't call a cop. I didn't need one. Right. And I don't think he needed to be corrected, fined or anything else. I think he got a very valuable life lesson. Yeah. He lived, he could walk away, stagger anyway. His friends helped him. Yeah, but he learned something. It was like, all right, this is real. You shouldn't be such an idiot. You gotta, he got it. You didn't have to rub it in. It was going to be throbbing probably for a few days after that. That's right. You did him a favor, whether he recognized that I or not. Right. So. Yeah. I think he did. I, honestly, I, I've had a number of people over the years after a while tell me, hey, Stormy, I know you. And it's kind of like I'm thinking, oh, shit, here it comes. He looks vaguely familiar. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's had his nose broke before. Mm. And, you know, it's kind of like, what is it? And then he's kind of telling me what he's doing now. And he's got a family. Is this? And it's kind of, wow. You know? Another uh, one of those guys. Well, it, I mean, people do learn. Some people do learn the hard way. Well, I did. Uh, on a number. Some things I learned easy and quick and clever. And other things... Jesus, I was walking into it for years and years, but that was part of the programming, the conditioning that they do to you. It's very self-destructive. Oh, yeah. uh, my number one command when I started replaying tapes to do the sleep teaching was I will never, ever make permanent solutions to temporary problems. This covered my kill switch and their kill switch, uh, uh, where, let's say, you're irritating the shit out of me. Okay, you're not, but let's say you were. All right, uh, you're a temporary problem. You're not a permanent problem. Things will change. Your attitude will change. You'll learn things as you go away, or I'll just walk the fuck away from you, and you're just kind of left there holding your ego or whatever, you know. Uh, uh, but that is a temporary thing. I don't have to go up and kill you or get sneaky, and that'll teach them. It's kind of like, no, karma will teach you your own lessons. Your own mouth, you're going to unload before somebody that's going to make you, you know, foot the bill for it. It doesn't have to be me or depending on how hard you insist, you know, there's a, a certain justice, a certain fairness in this, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, life is tough and people sometimes learn stuff the hard way. Me, I did. And it's kind of like I try to be considerate if I can that the other guy can survive his lesson too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if he's too bad, he may have to walk with a limp the rest of his life, but he's living, he's, you know, mm -hmm. that's right. you know, uh, you know uh, and if he's really bad, uh, do the world a favor and pull his plug. Mm -hmm. you He'll have no more victims after that. That's guarantee. Right. And the only way to guarantee, you know. Unless they want to put him in jail for life or bring back the death sentence or something like that. But can you trust them to do anything right? No, absolutely not. No. All you can trust is what you see, what you're in. This person is dedicated to trying to murder you or murder somebody. You see them. Why I couldn't be a cop, too. 
you know, at one point I considered it and it's kind of like, no, 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 that because when we get to the point where somebody say raping a baby or some little girl or something like that, and I know, you know, I see for a fact, here's, you know, he's there, they're, they're coming out of the bushes. She's, it's kind of like, exactly what would you do, Storm? I'd say, look at the bird, little girl. She ain't going nowhere. He's not leaving that, that place alive. Nobody's going to have to spend a lot of money trying and torturing a little girl with questions about what happened and that. I come, she's bloody, he's there, you know. Uh, uh, on top of her or whatever he is, like he might be helping her out of the woods from the guy who really did it. You have to consider that. But if if it's fully evident to you, be responsible to react appropriately. Yeah. You know, nobody should be denied their due process, except we're talking life and death, and. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, and this this person is already killed. He doesn't respect it, so he doesn't get it. You know, that's that's his just due. <laughs> you know, you're in the process of killing and doing this. You that's your just due to die. Surely you didn't expect to have a a long career of this. And, right. You know, <laughs> it's almost like you're enacting a cosmic law or enforcing a cosmic law. It is, but being born and raised in a witch clan, that's exactly the way my mind is geared and probably a good part of the other kind of conditioning that thwarted the full-on MK Ultra conditioning. It was there. It even has its effect even to this day. But my grandma, I learned and obeyed from the heart, not because I had to or because I said so, but because she could make me see and understand. And, you know, if she just looked at me like I just did something that disappointed her, I was heartbroken. And justifiably so. She was the one person that did the most for me. She's the one that actually came back and got me when I was 18 months old and at least got me where she could raise me in her house. But I had already, I already learned to speak English and German with a Bavarian accent from being in the program, being through that. But that was my first exposure to anything like family. And it was a very, very unusual family, but it was my family. Right. And I, Grandma made me feel like I belonged. The aunts had a problem with her teaching me to craft because they didn't teach men to craft in our family. Uh, uh, but I was born adept. I was, I, had, I was wired for it, and she knew it. And she felt that she would be irresponsible if she left me with those nuns. And I just decided somewhere along the line because the forces were so strong and wild in me to just go ape shit and hurt a whole lot of people that basically our family would be responsible for that. That was her attitude. Mm -hmm. So you got to see where I kind of got it from. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. On the, okay, you know, there's uh, some guys, you know, have a, like a knockout punch or whatever. And then also the people that, you know, if you get hit in the head, you know, some people, you know, have a glass jar. They go down a lot easier. Oh, yeah. But now um, it, it takes, would you say that it takes very little just to, to just to temporarily like uh, just make, not even make somebody see stars. It doesn't take very much force, does it? To what? Just to get him to see stars? Well, no, I mean just, just, just to, to get in the next one. Just little bitty rabbit punches, you know. Like just, if there's not much room or anything like that. I mean, because you know, trying to throw this knockout punch, you know. I mean, generally, you... well, I, yeah, I'll look for something stunning. But there's so many really good things you can do to throw even uh, even better with just a little bit of effort. Sometimes it's just as you're swinging down and dropping and pivoting your body, sometimes it's just sticking your elbow out and nailing him. I mean, with a lot of, as much torque as you can generate, just trying to get past his punch and everything, because you're going to have to move fast with the punch anyhow. All right. So let's say this guy's trying to hammer on you. You might want to just go ahead and put one up in his short ribs here. I had found any time, if I could crack just one rib and I do better than that easily, but if you can just crack a rib or bruise it good, what happens to the fight or their ability to fight after that, if you've ever gotten a cracked rib, 
if you take a deep breath, it feels like you just got a knife sticking in your lungs. The only, you don't want to swing your arm, jerk around, or move that side of your body fast, hard, or jerky at all. All you want to do, now if I just broke the ribs or cracked the ribs under your, say your right arm, say like you're, or you're a lefty, whichever way, you know, if I just cracked those ribs, I just took away your ability to swing at me with that arm effectively. Because every time, just swinging would hurt you more than it hurt me, and you're not going to make contact. So it's kind of like, whew, it's like watch him beat himself up trying. Nobody really does after a couple flinches. They're just kind of like, and they want to go away. They want to just talk. And me, let them. Yeah, they, they, they change their attitude real quick, don't they? Well, sometimes they get a little badass, you know, and get their friends and stuff like that. It happens, you know, when you live in the same city and it's like you're not going to run away or, or yourself. They're, they, I've seen that happen or blossom more than once. But for the most part, it's kind of like, all right, you know, I kind of got it. They'll talk a lot of shit. You're lucky I wasn't feeling better. The light was in my eyes. It's always something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got me. You hit me when I wasn't looking. You were in the middle of a swing. Of course you weren't looking. <laughs> yeah, you know? they snuck. They, they, you snuck them or something. Well, definitely did. Right while they're swinging, right. or while they were inhaling, mm -hmm. or you know, there's little things you learn to look for. You know, when they're in the middle of a swing, uh, uh, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do calls that the stalking fist or the stop hat. It, it, it's you. You know, you move inside it, and basically you thwart it. They're not ready to block. People are used to boxers are used to this one two one two one two. Check out, uh, uh, it might be a video, I don't know if it's under Witchman 53 or Storm 53, called the Jedi Finger Flick. Uh, it, it's a nickname that my students and, and, and that kind of gave to the technique. It, it's not what it was, but it's what it looks like when other people see it. All right, because it doesn't go one, two, it's one. And it doesn't look like a move that you had to cock that fist from the Georgia you know, to draw up, to get that kind of power to send that person flying uh, uh, because it's a short, circular move. Uh, in Kung Fu, Jeet Kune Do, Wing Chun, they call this a short, circular fist. The power is generated not from here to here, but from here to here. Mm -hmm. And it's got that kind of impact to have that send this guy fly. And if you're kind of, and in Kempo, especially the masters, the people up there, you decide at the last minute what whether you want a fist, a dart, a claw, whatever, the iron palm, what do you want to use? You decide, let the hand decide at the last minute where, where what's best to put it where, all right? Because different targets open up all the time. It's, it's a very dynamic thing in the middle of a fight. Mm -hmm. So in me, some of the hardware kind of, and I mean physical hardware, kind of gives me a little heads up in my eyeballs where all your nerve endings and vulnerable spots, every time you move, it's like they're lit up to me, all right? But that's something in me, not on you. It's, it's something they did to me. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, I mean, you can do it just by knowing what they are. Man, that's a sensitive spot. Whack it! Right. Get it! Stick your thumb in it. Oh, that's really good, especially around the ribs. You can turn around. Now, here's one, non-lethal, two thumbs. We used to call this hitchhiker, all right? And he's got his arms up. Dig right in here real hard. Hit. Drive it in. If you've got a couple big pens in your hand or a yawara, you know, something that you can poke them with, drumsticks, uh, 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 you don't necessarily have to pierce them. You do it hard enough, you will, but... You don't necessarily have to pierce them. There's nerve bundles right here and right here. And if you really mash them both good enough, she kind of goes into kind of, it looks like a seizure. Actually, it is a seizure because the neural system overloads. So for a little while, depending on how resilient and tough that bastard really is, uh, uh, some will be down longer than incapacitated others longer. That's why we don't do the knockout thing on an actual mission. Right. You, know, you don't know how long they're going to be down there. That might be Chuck Norris, and the minute you turn around, he's got his foot up your ass. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 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 all right. Uh, uh, anybody else, it's like you can come back, and they're not waking up till their clothes are out of style. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, the head, you can, break, you can break your hand hitting somebody in the head, can't you? If you, if you hit it wrong, if you hit, if you hit right, 
and that you can put your fist through through a brick wall, uh, and and a lot of people do. That's not it's not all that unusual a feat, and not everybody that's doing their ultras, and they've been doing it for thousands of years. So the tra- the tra- that's a, somewhere where the training you know really comes in. The into- training and the conditioning for Iron Fist comes in. That's where uh, you know Master Panching Fu. Uh, in China, well, actually, he's living in Toronto these days. Well, his thing, he, uh, uh, he's probably like the original Iron Fist, Iron Hand. He practices Iron Hand Kung Fu. And what that consists of, besides a lot of the usual techniques, is conditioning his hand every day for like hours on end. He's got this iron plate that he hits, he palms, he strikes in different ways over and over and over again all day. Every day he's been doing this for, geez, as long as I'm old at, at this point in time. But uh, he was famous in, uh, among the Chinese for being kind of like the gangbusters. He was the cop they'd send in. He'd take out whole triads. He hits you, you stay hit. Because the microfracturing, that, that conditioning, the bang, banging, on, in his case, the iron plate, a lot of the karate masters, uh, Mas Ayamas, used to use bricks and stuff and just insist that I just keep, I'd put towels over them and you just keep smacking them and smack. And, you know, and after a while, as you get more used to it, you start taking towels away and punching them and stuff like that until finally, I think, I think I was about, what was I, I think I was 12, no, I was 13 when I smashed through my first concrete block at uh, my fist. It was the one I'd been working on a long time, so it might have had stress fractures, but that was my first one. It was like, yahoo, you know, yeah. and I did not break my fist. I broke the concrete. Right. That makes you think different about yourself. People put up walls on you, and it's kind of like, they got me hemmed in, and it's kind of like, well, break it down. Oh, the door's locked. I haven't seen very many doors that could stop me or even stop a lot of my more normal type students, you know, serious. I've had Rangers recon. I respect the hell out of them. And when they let me or when they respect me enough to let me take them the next mile. And a lot of their cases, a lot of clandestine, like, like bear, for instance, people that train, I trained the people that trained him, you know, by 78, like I said, I was out, but sometimes they would send people to my studios and I train on, on my terms. It's kind of like, do I want an American, you know, fighting man to be very able? You bet your ass I do. I don't want him to go in there and die for what he believes in. Uh, 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 it's like, and if you come to me and, and this is where you're going, I'm signed up or I got to be back in a couple of weeks back to training. I've had Lejeune send me a squad to have ninja camp one summer. We had a time. Oh, we had a great time. Yeah, it, uh, it's like, I love Marines. Can't eat a whole one by myself, but I love Marines. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't think anybody can. But, uh, you know, and Rangers, crazy bastards. Love them, too. The serious ones. Seals, there's some really good ones. Some of them kind of scare me a little bit. It's just that part that maybe likes death too much. That's just a few that I knew. That's... That, that, you know, and if you ever wonder, why didn't they go ahead and become a SEAL? I saw them and decided against it. Decided I was better as my own agent and as an ultra. I didn't want to kind of, that uh, disturbed me a little. And it's like, I, you didn't I got to mix it to trash. I just aren't going to torture it and play with it and, and, and worship its going or anything else. It's like, you know, I just made life easier for a whole lot of people. Actually, I carried out a contract or an execution. It's like when they say extreme prejudice, it means not prejudice like calling somebody the N-word. It means pre-judged. The judgment is already done. He wasn't going to show up at a trial or anything else. We know what he did. This is the judgment. This is the sentence. And basically, I was an executioner that made house calls. If it was just a thug or a gangster and it could be done shoot 'em up style or had to be done shoot 'em up style, then as far as anybody was concerned locally, it was a local gang. Though, as I find out from my friend, uh, the bookseller, it's kind of like that didn't fool everybody all the time. And that they knew it was the CIA and the spooks running their stuff. 
that uh, I mean, the people knew, and I like that. I really like that they knew, you know, because I keep trying to let the cat out of the bag, let all the secrets be exposed, their dirty secrets, because you keep thinking these guys are the good guys and that they're our guys. And it's no, they'd ass rape your grandmama in front of you, you know, just to make a point. Uh, 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 you know, that's the kind of people they are. It's really, it's not an exaggeration. They're n they just, there's nothing they won't do. No depths they won't stoop to. Uh, yeah, so I, and my, uh, and the audience heard everything you said, but my headphones had become unplugged. When you said, who are, who's at the, this day that will, there's nothing that they won't stoop to? Which group of people was that? CIA, our black government. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. Yeah, our black government, and it's kind of like, so like I said, sometimes we come in and in fire in like that, but other times it's like, okay, it's somebody who has to have that air of respectability and the people that he's schmoozing with, namely other respectable but very corrupt people who know what the hell he is. And So for their sakes, this guy's got to die of natural causes or an accident, which is natural causes as well, but... Nobody could suspect that it was a murder, a hit, an assassination, you know, so that is a word that can't come up, you know, not allowed to come up. So everything you do is geared to do this job and not make that word ever come up. Make it convincingly so, the more they scrutinize it, yep, he fool got drunk and fell down the steps and broke his freaking neck. What can you say? He does it all the time. This time it killed him. Yep. Huh? Yep. His uncle got drunk. Fell over the banister, broke his head on the deck of the pool. You know, the concrete deck of the pool. Stuff happens. Yeah. You know? But like any witch, you know, people, people, muggles tend to think you know, they're victims of circumstances, you know? You know, they got to, you know, what happened to you? You were going to do this. Well, shit happens. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, it does. But see, a witch doesn't look at life that way. Witch means wise one, not Satanist or anything else. It just means wise. You're wise. You know, just like Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I'm sending you out into a world full of wolves. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. You better have some venom that works in case you need it. This doesn't mean you go to try to eat the damn wolf. Snakes don't eat wolves. But when the wolf comes, make them respect the snake. All right? Uh, uh, so be wise. You know, uh, uh, when it comes, when you see it coming, the witch is no victim of circumstance. A witch is a master of the circumstances. Where the muggle says, hey, I, I couldn't do it, shit happens. The witch says, I have the power to make shit happen. And when you've been at 12 years old through spy school and everything else, and you get this clandestine type thing, you know, you, you begin to really fully realize how many tools and opportunities are all around you to make, you know, around anybody and everybody that if you wanted to, if that's the way you wanted to focus your, focus your attention, you could make all kinds of shit happen around that person. Actually, I used to do it to my handlers. I put them into, inevitably, they wouldn't, it was just a matter of time before they had nervous breakdown. Because I would do things that would have them worried for their lives, their jobs, their careers, and everything. Discreetly, if you got bold and ballsy and just kind of went up in their face and flipped your finger and said, this is what I'm going to do, you'd be an experiment in one of those institutions. First time they could get you in, in, in restraints, you know, you're not going to live to do it or at least not in any ability to do it anymore. Uh, they fear you. They'll, they'll neutralize you, you know. But if they think they can handle you and you're just some punk kid and maybe a little too bright and clever for your own good... It's kind of like, yeah, you go ahead and believe that and start wondering why all this shit's happening to you. And I'm just sitting here smiling to myself. It's like as they do things, it's like don't blow your steam out, you know, in a rage and threatening and anything else. Just look at them quietly and take account. Yeah, I'm going to remember all of this. It may come in useful. That's right. It may come in uh, karmically appropriate. Uh, uh, and the time will come, you'll get that chance to survive. I believe it was the Roman general Tacitus said that if you sit by the river long enough, you get to see the bodies of your enemies come floating by. Yeah. Me? Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a lot of times not a good idea to confront, you know? 
not right off the bat. No, actually, see me, if, if I were to go, if, if I was that kind of man where I go up and slap your face or punch you, I expect you to get up and hit me back. I kind of got this equality thing. I don't naturally think you're some gutless pussy. All right. It's like if I do this, I expect you're going to try to do something, at least try to do something back. No matter how badass I am, I expect you to try to hit. I did that when the, for the first time I, I trained Duncan. At, uh, and he said, well, this is um, he picks up this boken off of the rack and he's looking and now he's not holding it like a lot of the other guys did. Some of them hold it like it was a freaking tennis racket. Some of them hold it as like a freaking golf club or a baseball bat. Duncan kind of had a like uh, in his hand. It was like it was natural for him, but he really wasn't trained. Yeah, and, and I just kind of noticed that. And, you know, this was at the end of the class and everybody's getting ready to go off to chow and I hold them back. And I go take a boken from the other side and I'm talking to him and trying to explain what an ultra is. And he's kind of like, I don't get it. And I said, well, we're going to spar. He says, this isn't fair. You're a master. I'm just a kid. Yada, yada, yada. And it's like, Bobby, this was his name or what he was known as. Now, what makes you, when was anything, you know what they did to you. He always had this haunted look in his eyes when he was a kid. And it's like, when had they ever did anything? You know, this is the look of a victim. Or a person that's about to become a perpetual, habitual victim. All right? And it was kind of like, and I, he had a strong Kentucky accent, especially as a kid. He couldn't lose it. And, and me, I'm kind of a New Yorker, city slicker kind of guy. And I'm kind of rubbing it in a little bit. But what I'm looking for is that little spark where, like, Yankee, I'm going to make you regret saying that. He didn't say it, but I saw it in his eyes. And I says, okay, I'll tell you what. All you got to do. It's hit me once with that, with that book. Just once. You don't have to win. All you have to, and you don't have to clob. All you have to, if you touch me with that thing, you win and I'll tell you what you are. You know, I don't tell you what this is all about and, and, and teach you something the other students don't know. So we get into it. He's, he's kind of, I, I called him a Kentucky Fried Hasey a couple times. And he, it's his stance. I didn't teach him that stance. And he didn't learn it from another teacher. It wasn't perfect. It was improvised. But he had the right ideas in his mind as to how he was moving his body and gaining his balance so he could make me, as best he could, try to hit me with that boken. He was serious about it. And it's like, we went at it. I, I, I gave him a couple, wrapped him a few times, give him some goose eggs on his head. At one point, he looked like he had two horns about ready to grow out here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he comes down. At, at one point, he, he drops and spins. And I definitely don't expect this out of somebody that's never had martial arts before. But from some gangly teen that's chased, chased freaking hound dogs or whatever through the hills of Kentucky... That was an agile, clever freaking move. And he managed to come up under my feet, catch my feet, tip me back. And as he was swinging, he still had his sword arm out. So the boken smacked me across my shin. And But instead of going all the way back, I kipped up, flipped over his head, bopped him as I was coming over, come down on the other side, pinned him to the floor by his neck on his face. And he goes, oh, God, what are they going to do to me now? And I says, I don't think they're going to do anything to you. And he says, well, what do you mean? I says, I told you you had to touch me once. He says, didn't I? And I said, you touched me twice. He goes, oh, God. And it's kind of like, you know, you don't understand. Pick him up, help him up. And I says, well, what's it? I says, it means you're, we're ultras, Bobby, like me. You know, I never called him anything but after that. You know, no Kentucky Fried Hayseed or anything else. It was all right, you're in, now you're going to earn the chance. And it's not like he did anything cocky. I just had to see the, the fight, the, the, the person that was d at least beginning to not want to be the victim. Because if they put him out in the field, that kid was going to die. You know, when you go into the ring, into a fight, no matter how bad or big they look or what their reputation is, if you think that sucker's going to beat you, getting in the ring is only a formality. You already lost. But if you're looking at him and you think, you know, I just might 
no way to take that big sucker out. I might just be able, I'm going to look for a way to finagle. You're not beaten yet. The fight is real. The fight's going to be good. You know, it's, it's like he didn't come into that with it. They, they'd abused us so much and a lot of them so much. It's kind of like, well, stir a little fire. And I tried never to abuse them too much or anything like that, at, at least at that beginning stages. Once they earned that, unless they did something stupid. And, uh, and then I'd do something that would kind of humiliate them, but you don't kill them or hurt them or break their legs. Even the ones that aren't ultras, uh, uh, you know. So, uh, at that time you were, a, a, when you were at the very beginning, when you were training Duncan Ophinion, you were, uh, officially in the armed forces, but he was not, he was like officially a citizen, a civilian. No, I wasn't, I wasn't officially anymore at that time either. Okay. And I was uh, after after nineteen seventy after late nineteen seventy. I was out of the Navy, the United States Navy. That was my quote armed forces. But see, I was an MK Ultra the program from day one. Always, it wasn't like I didn't have to go back or go to different things and all this other kind of stuff and, and go through all these programs like an outpatient rather than you know uh, uh, you know dormitory or stuff like that. But I really didn't think they had too many people that actually came through, especially out of my crash. Uh, there wasn't a lot of survivors, and those that did, you couldn't exist outside of an institution. Oh, you know? yeah. Let's less send them out to do a job. This was the thing that used to always get me sitting back and scratching my head for a long time, wondering, why not me? You know, what, what, what is I, you know, sooner or later, my luck's going to, every time I went on a mission, I figured sooner, the more you do it, the more the odds are that your number comes up. I mean, every soldier knows that, you know, and the more you, you know, it's kind of like sooner or later. And it's like, and I got scars you, you, you shouldn't have come back from. And said, well, it was a glancing blow. Uh, you know, uh, there's a technique also in Kung Fu called iron shirt, where you develop your musculature, where you, it's a twitch reflex. Where you can flex just like that. People can stick a knife in you, but it only goes in about that far. You know, and you can keep it from going in further just by, <clears throat> in fact, you could take it away from them by that. Wow. Uh, it's called iron shirt. Uh, and basically, you're developing those twitch muscles, you know, your, your body to, to flex. And, I mean, like rock hard in a split second. And, you know, if you practice that and work that, you're going to find places, I don't care who you are or who you train with. You're not going to hurt yourself, and at the same point, it's going to be harder to hurt you if you've been practicing and working that a little bit. Yeah, it makes all... you look more survivable. Everything that they did to us was to make us more survivable, able to go out, actually do the job, and, you know, as overkill as possible. All right, because you want them to come back, teach the others, give you information, and 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 you want, if you can make it, an army of these that could just sweep through a place like, you know, drop a bunch of us in a city and we could knock it down if we had to. Uh, you know, who needs a bomb? At, uh, I think they were looking for that. I don't think they were able to ever achieve that. They like to brag that they got this, that, and everything else. But honestly, when I see them actually test things out, uh, uh, I was watching some of their, they were bragging about how, you know, during Iraq, how their Patriot missiles were. And, and there are rarely one in four ever made contact with its target. And it's like, yeah, they'd brag, it can do this and that and find an enemy here and there. But every one they fired, only one in four, and not totally neutralized the target. Not every time. You know, so, you know, what, you know that's 25%. There's a big difference. Oh, they're going to bring this and wipe us out. No, they're going to miss you. And now you've got a second chance to take them out. Yeah. On the battlefield, there's only two types, quick and the dead. Well, they're thinking about, geez, let's load that next one. You keep moving. You know? uh, and that's how we stayed alive. That's how we come back. Uh, you know, you hesitate, you stand, you don't hit somebody hard enough or lethal enough, and you have to spend a couple more seconds long. While that's happening, people around you are lining up their sights trying to get you. Which one is the, which one is him? I don't have a shot. I don't have a shot. He stops. I got a shot. You're dead. Mm -hmm. Or you're hurt very bad. 
and it's going to be really hard to complete the mission. I've had that too. But you do it. Now, is there, a, depending on the weapon and depending on the circumstances, if you're within a certain distance, you ever move towards the weapon, or, or uh, I guess, or, I guess you toward, I guess it would be towards the. Well, I remember a, a lot of the semi-automatics, the, the pistols, and that. I, I, I uh, and even the, yeah, even the revolvers. I move into because, especially on the revolvers, whether it be a double or single action. If you can get the web of your hand between the trigger and that, you you know, as you want to wrest it out of their hands, if you can get close enough to touch them or grab them or something like that, on the, on the semi-automatics, if you push back on the slide, the gun cannot fire. Uh, uh, and depending on how quick or easy, you know, Hollywood would make you believe, <laughs> some models don't come apart quite that easily, but they don't fire as long as you've got pressure on the slide even if it's just like an eighth or a quarter of an inch back, it won't fire until you let off. So the pressure, you know, if you're pushing in, you want to keep pushing your whole body into him so he can't pull it back and let that gun, you know, that trigger slam down and he blows you away. Yeah. You got to keep the pressure going all the way to the ground if you have to, mm -hmm. but don't take that off and try to angle that away from yourself mm -hmm. uh, as you're going down. Um, hey, hey, yeah. And an untrained assailant, they're definitely not going to expect you to come towards them. I mean, you know, that, that, that catches them by surprise. No, they, they almost, not even on the streets and in the gang stockings, do they ever expect us to do. But see, that's also the way I train my students. The first rule, you know, and I used to make them repeat this, expect the unexpected, you know. Come in and do something that nobody's expecting, slap them. Not hard, just enough to know, you know, they can be been had and that. Show them, okay, I'm going to touch you right here. And there's nothing you can do about it. And then psych them and touch them right there. And then it's kind of, you know, mess with them a little bit, you know, like that till they start to develop the reflexes and, the, you know, where they start watching more for little cues. And, you know, you, you train them into it. Uh, um, but I was going to go someplace else with that. Uh, I hate it when I do that. <laughs> That's not the reefer either. I need another hit. I'm sweating. Oh, well, we'll go. by all means, take take one. I, I'm going to grab a drink of my beer here. I'm not going anywhere, but take take a hit. We'll, we'll, all we'll, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab, yeah, I also want to grab a quick quick uh, cold drink to whip my whistle and go to the bathroom. It, it'll just be probably two minutes. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. We'll just edit this little part out. A little, okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's gonna do. Oh, hey, woo! Uh, is it a? Uh, uh, anyway, I'm I'm just gonna ask this question: Is it uh, legal for you to uh, do what you just did? I've got a card and everything, and a license to even grow my own. And okay. Process it and make it, and yeah, everything here is absolutely legal. Well, the re um, the reason I asked you that is because you know you were you were saying something about the medicinal uh, aspects of uh, marijuana and everything well, earlier. I, I, that's why I came here to Nevada. All right. right? Uh, I was on uh, medications, gabapentin and Keppra, and a couple of you. You'll see people that's been taking it. Well, you, you use it for seizures, uh, a, a number of things like that, uh, epilepsy. But it'll turn you into, I don't care if you're young, it's going to turn you into uh, a drooling, incontinent, well, I wasn't incontinent, narcoleptic. Uh, uh, you're going to need assisted living the longer you're taking it, all right? So even if you're young and you're taking it, 
It's going to make a doddering old fool out of you in a nursing home within a matter of years, way before your time. What, what are you talking uh, about, the pharmaceutical drugs? Gabapentin and Keppra. I named oh. them. We, we had some shill on one, you know, on one, one of your, your pages try to say, he, say, he said he's only 55 years old and he's too young to have been in them. And I, I'm, I'm trying to argue with this guy. No, you said I was 55. Right. I remember distinctly saying I was 17 years old in 1970, and I was in Cambodia, and he's, he's you, know, you know, well, what, how do you explain, it's kind of, I, you said this, fool, you know, uh, uh, not me, it's like, so I try to make sure I, I, I got everything straight, my facts straight, and that, but, but uh, yeah, here, this is the thing, now I got off of the gabapentin and the kephra here, because Bear, uh, my very own personal Apache medicine man, and the, I swear by Bear, I tell you, uh, uh, he is amazing in what he's capable of doing. It, you know, I, I know why I, where, why and where I got my training from, but mine isn't traditional Native American. And every time I know a few, a couple anyway, Native American Sham Bear being one, he's legit and traditional. Uh, uh, they tell me something that sounds so simple. But when I do it or I exercise it, what happens is so profound, it's, it just blows me away. So Bear helped me get off of the gabapentin and the Keppra and the Acupril that I was taking for my high blood pressure. It would spike to really impossible things. That's why I had the strokes. Uh, um, it's the kill switch, you know. I've outlived my usefulness and, and, and all of that. And I'd be fighting off the effects of the strokes. Man, it took me work months and years to develop my left side back again, and and uh, you know it, it, that's been a real trial. Now, know. let me ask you this: so it uh, even it just like a, it's not. And so, in other words, it's not going to hurt your feelings. It, in other words, you were taking a bong hit right in front of the camera. That's that's it's okay if that gets shown. Uh, no, that's per that is. See, the, the point I want, well, actually, I wasn't trying to make a point. I actually just kind of like, well, I sat down. I forgot to, I prepared everything, got my coffee, got ready to take my hit for the, for the joint pain. I, you know, I have to, I put a little bit of flour in there and uh, mix a little bit of the CBD itself. What that is, is like indicas tend to be high in THC, lower in CBDs. Sativas tend to be higher in CBDs, lower in THCs. One gives you a more cerebral rush the other one gives you more of a body rush a little of both really but uh but when i mix that together and then i only do it that in one hitters i could i mean if i wanted to party it's fine it's not it wouldn't hurt me right. uh but in order to be i can function well this is this is medicine uh, a one hitter of the flower and the cbt both it's kind of like having uh a nice really badass indica and a badass sativa all in one uh, and you know, one good hit, and uh, it's almost within seconds the joint pain, that deep bone pain from the cancer, the seizures. As long as the stuff, the CBD is in my blood system, I my seizures, which used to be a hundred plus a day, maybe one or two. Wow, small ones. That's a powerful that's testimony. Not, it's incredible. St See, that's that's the thing. It's kind of like. This is serious medicine. You don't have to go chasing off to the Amazon for it. We're being denied it. Now I got the doctors. Some of the doctors that I'm dealing with with the oncology and stuff are working with me with the cannabis. There's a lot of doctors that won't. In just about, I can't use it while I'm in the hospital or in the clinic, but you know, I'm documented as it and I need it. And it's kind of, that's what it does. I do not take the other stuff anymore. I only take my insulin and the chemo, and the other stuff is just basically supplements, B, B1 supplements, far, 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 formic acid, uh, things my body is... is uh, okay, is so and my, my father died of cancer. Let me, have you heard of the GCMAF or the GC multifage? I heard of a couple of these. Some of these they were saying could, could uh, uh, you know, is acting as even a cure for cancer. Um, see, I had, I'd say I was fairly good and saturated. Far, far more. If I knew what I then what I know now about pot, I would actually smoke more sooner. Honestly, 
because of the numerous uh, benefits your body actually pulls from it. And then when you're eating it in edibles, well, you've seen the fiber and hemp rope. You know, you ever heard the saying? Now, see, I train soldiers and martial artists, all right? You are what you eat. I will tell you what to eat, how to breathe, what to drink. And I'm not just, just you know, overthrowing my authority just to impress you or me or anything else. I, when I do it, I want to, uh, generally your diet's going to be very high in fiber in a number of things because you're going to put on muscle and that muscle, the, your body's going to, the cells are going to be produced from the fuel that you're putting in your body. Now, if the fuel that you're putting in your body is freaking hemp, like hemp rope, and it's edible and it's, your body is perfectly fine with it and you put on some, just some decent triceps, they don't even have to be big. Triceps of hemp rope. Do you have any idea how hard that is to hit when somebody hits you? What their fist or their hand feels like? Or what it feels like to get hit by you because of the kind of strength and torque you, you, know, you can get off of your musculature with that? So it's kind of like, yeah, some of the things you eat can turn around and help you get that little edge. Every gunfighter is looking for that little edge. That one thing between the quick and the dead that keeps him on the quick side of the occasion. All right. You shave anything you can shave. No one, two. It's one. Uh, uh, you just shaved, you know, shaved it down 50% in one move. Besides that, it's not a move they expect. They're used to one, two. At, uh, there's also, I used to do things like I'd call uh, make and break. You'd set up a rhythm. This is, this is the YMCA kind of stuff. You want to kick ass in tournaments and have fun at, uh, you know, because you're not really killing anybody here in that, but you're having a lot of fun. You get in there and you do what I call a make and break. I wish this was a little, a little more able, but it's kind of like an upper back knuckle like this. Comes up like so, at, and, and it comes down like this. And hits in what's it's a hammer fist, so it's hitting high, low, high. So you're going for like the head or the face. Or the, I like the bridge of the nose, or you know, I could put that anywhere I wanted, but someplace it's going to sting real good. You know, I could just hit and snap it hard. You know, you're not going to crack his skull. You're just going to wrap him. You know, uh, 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 let him know he's been tagged. You know, uh, and then you go low, go for the stomach. If he, he gets to this. Now, you're, you're, you're fighting a guy that's not a pussy. He's not going to take the hit. He's going to do everything, and he's going to block. He's going to go upward block to block your hammer fit or your uh, back knuckle, and he's going to go downward, outward block to block your, 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 your lower fist coming in. He's going to protect, right? So he's going to go high, low, high, low, high, low. And what I end up doing is something is I'll go high, low, high, low, high, high, because he'd already jerked to go low, and he's like, his head's wide open, high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're yeah, pulling him. Yeah, you're so pulling him into a pattern. You set up a rhythm, right? Just, rhythm. just a quick rhythm. Don't go too long, or they'll be on top of you. Mm -hmm. Just enough rhythm where they can anticipate you, and when they do, don't be there. Uh, Mr. Miyagi, the best, the best, best block for a punch is don't be there. And there's a whole bunch of other things that uh, the ninja taught me about fading in, fading out. And I'm not talking about dimensionally. I'm talking about physically how you move, directing the vulnerable parts of your body away from your attacker's blow. Let them go ahead and throw it. But as it does, it's sliding by. You know, it can be sliding by as you're backing up from it. Or it can be you can let it slide by as you're moving in for the kill, for the, for the throat shot. You know, you get that arm past you and you move, you slide in. Instead of twirling away from, say, like an arrow or a spear or something and, 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 and catching it by yourself that little split second time or moving in and just moving inside their guard and taking them out. But you always have to consider their other arms. One thing those karate books never do. They got that guy standing there and that guy moves in there and this guy, what's this guy doing with this arm? This hand is just staying there. And personally... I never fought anybody on the streets that just kind of shot that one out, and this one just kind of stayed there. Yeah, generally, if it was out on the streets and it was anybody that had any business getting in a fight at all, you know, they were out there and all over you like ugly on an ape. Oh, man. Wow. Now, uh, yeah. I'd say a kick, a kick to the groin can be uh, lethal. <laughs> well... 
I tried that on this big Samoan fella back in a Kumite in Singapore back in 77. He just grinned at me. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah. And it's kind of like, now, now me, I could probably pull myself together quicker, but you're going to know you hit me in the nets. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, my eyes are going to cross and blur for about a second, but I'm going to recoup very fast. But, and, and it's still going to hurt later, but it's going to hurt later. <laughs> You know, but uh, I remember that guy. No, he wasn't. He wasn't going down like that. The only other thing I could think of was uh, I, I had a, a, a guy before him that that guy before me that had him. He was really dynamic with the short punches and stuff. And and. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> and he was hammering on his ribs, but this guy had like a layer of, of, of fat. But there was like bare muscle under that fat you, you just had to know it is like if he did iron shirt it's kind of like you're hitting a, a concrete wall with an inch of foam in front of it right yeah you know? and, and and about the same effect it was affecting him about the same as the wall and uh so it's kind of like all right I, I can't do that one uh try to knock him off, well off or out of the platform is how you win or you disable them or you can even kill them in the, in a, in the in, in some of these kumites but they ain't gonna like you if you do uh so i was trying to think of something non-lethal you know you realize there's a fight going on he moves deceptively fast and um uh, sorry i got distracted a sec at uh so i'm trying to decide is it, it, the nads i nailed the nads like i said he grinned at me and if he got close to me and those big hands got a hold of me i was afraid he was going to break me like he did the guy before me uh because i was a lightweight compared to him he's big like me and he's big bigger like me and you got to know that big frame and under all that lard was a lot of muscle that moves that lard around real easy. Oh, and yeah. all of that weight pinning you and doing this guy looked like he could rip my arms off like taking legs off a fly, you know. Oh man. So I'm not going to let him grab me by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want to do a throat shot or at least not one bad enough. I got to figure I He's too stable in that low kind of almost sumo wrestler stance to just drop kick and knock him off. Or, I got to check that in a minute unless it's in, at, uh, uh, out of the ring. Um, you know, well, there's no ropes on these rings. It's like you get knocked out of the circle or off the platform and it's not a far one. You know, you're out. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're done. So and he looked like he could knock me off of it easier. Uh, so playing like that was not a good strategy. So I decided instead to go for the eye, but I was careful. If you go 45 inward towards the, towards the nose, that in and thrust, basically you go to where the not optic nerve is. For an assassin, this is a quick kill. You can do it with a pen or anything. You're like, we frisked him. He didn't have any weapons. Just his pen is kind of like, that's enough. That's plenty. That just, just like this. Right in there, 45 degrees. It's, so, it's, it, it's just as effective as if you just shot him with a 38. And you can, that's dirty. Even if he lived, he's going to die and badly. The infection, whew, no way, you know, there's no walking away from that. That's nasty, okay? I didn't do anything like that. This time I just went in from the, from the side, scooped outward, and put his eye out, which hurt a lot, and had his eye hanging by his nerve on his chin. This guy's going, oh, he's holding his head. He stood up. His legs is, you know, boom, kicked him off the platform. You know, the only way I was going to do it without killing him or anything, and there was some rules in a lot of these tournaments as to how I won or how often I won. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, some, that's some full contact shit right there. Uh, what? Yeah, well, yeah, that, yeah. Those are and those are almost literally no rules. At, uh, um, you know, uh, in fact, if you slipped if you slipped a knife in your shorts and in the middle of the contest you pulled the knife out and cut their throat or threw it at them or something, you still won. The the thing with those are is when you. Advanced to a certain level in martial arts, I don't care where you are, who you are, it, it, it's, it's been going on for centuries, 
at uh, 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 somewhere along the line, can you beat this style? This style's the best, this style's the best. Can you beat another? How do you, you know, how, how do you rank as a warrior? And the only way to find that is on, on the battlefield. Are there rules on the battlefield? There's never rules on the battlefield. There's no, it's whatever you got, you're facing anything and everything. And, and can you take it without, well, he's a bit bigger, you know, this is a bigger man than me or a smaller man than me or, or whatever. There's no belt rank. Well, at that level, they automate, you have to be belt ranking. It doesn't matter your belt. It's your proficiency, what you're known for. There's people that are, aren't in any known style of martial arts, but have been around the block more than enough times to, to have their gear together and know how, know how expertly how to hurt somebody quickly. Uh, I used to have a great respect for the Gracies from Brazil uh, uh, back in the 60s and that those were, you know, uh, but I, I was into more lethal things than the grappling and that uh, nerves, uh, precision acupressure points, uh, crushing blows, organ damage, failure, what you can cause instantly, what you can cause over time, uh, weak parts of the body, you know, the guy comes in, he's, uh, he's dressed in riot gear, and uh, he's got a face mask and bulletproof, and it's kind of like, you going to bang on him? Nah, nah, a couple of lighter fluid and a, and a match will work just fine, because Kevlar doesn't stop gasoline and fire or flame. It's just as simple as that. And, and, and I don't need a permit to call a flame up, you know, That's butane, right. propane, what, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, watch that stuff melt while it's on you, buddy. You know, right. Not impressed, you know, you, Good point. sooner or later, they're going to come across soldiers who know how to fight and they're going to, these guys feeling all frisky and full of testosterone in their donut bags and Kevlar are, are going to find out that Americans and especially well-skilled Americans or no pushover, and you don't have to be all that skilled. All you have to do is be thinking and and not paralyzed with fear. Yeah, that'll stop bullets. That'll stop a knife. It'll render my blows or my kicks. I, you know, if you got good force, I can still knock them down, but I'm not going to do much damage. And all his buddies are going to bang on me with those sticks if I let them. But it's kind of like, all right, shooting them. This that that ain't good. But what is good? Lighten them up. Molotov cocktail, they, and, and it's even harder for them to get out of that, all that melted nylon and Kevlar than it is. Oh, it's like, yeah. damn, nasty way to go. But if you insist, really, I'm going to mm -hmm. shoot my dog and my family and beat up my brother or whatever, something like that, you insist? Yep. Seriously? How far you want to push it before you think somebody who isn't a pussy is going to hit back? That's right. You like know. I say, no matter what I do, I expect you to hit back or try to. You know, this cowering, this is something people get conditioning to. This is, you know, once in a while I come across a coward, but a whole society conditioned to. That's scary. It is. And, and, and all the TV shows that back it up, like uh, Big Bang Theory, we, we, there, there hadn't been a, they hadn't showed a real man on there yet in however many seasons they've been in there. You know, I mean, we're... Uh, I actually, well, actually, I've seen, I've only seen a few episodes of it. I don't get it. I don't watch things that got commercials or that, that kind of TV. If I can get it on Netflix or something where they're not going to interrupt me while I'm watching, it's like, that's good. And I can pause it and pick up where I look, you know, that's good. Or, you know, I, I watched a couple of them. I, I would like see in, in my, fa well, I'm the nerd. I'm the one that teaches the young ones and, and all this kind of stuff. I'm uh, Mr. Wizard, uh, you know, the science, Bill Nye, the science guy, my uh, son described me in a Father's Day uh, essay in school as Batman, Bruce Lee, and Merlin the Magician rolled all into one. So oh. I'm about as nerdy as you're going to get, except I am, well, actually, I'm built, I'm built exactly like Darth Vader. I mean, David Prowse, who played him, six foot five, around 220 to 240 pounds, uh, uh, except I'm an ultra, I don't break easily, you know, that's a, he was a very respectable man, at, uh, 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 it's kind of, like, yeah, if you saw John Cleese, uh, David Prowse, and me all standing together, you'd be looking at 
three totally unrelated guys that are just kind of standing together, looking down at everybody's pattern baldness, trying. <laughs> you recognize that guy? Yes, I know that pattern baldness anywhere. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've often wondered what the views like from up there. It's a whole different perspective on life, isn't it? Oh, it is. Like like Bear and Melissa, I says, you know, it's a wonder you guys don't sparkle here. And he says, well, why is that? And I says, they gave me this stool, a shower stool. There's a handle on there. This place is set up for people with disabilities. And we're all three of us disabled, but we take care of each other. And they gave me the shower stool. Now, for a guy my size, almost anywhere in America, it's a very rare place that I could go stand in a shower, turn it on, and basically it gets from about my nipples down wet until I bend over to get under it. So right. sitting on a stool, I get to kind of relax. The shower is beating down on my head and shoulders. And it's like, I bless you every time I sit down on that thing. And it's kind of why it's not often. I usually got to be bent over almost half to get my head and shoulders wet like that. And it's kind of like, yeah, my back don't feel all that great from it. I ain't going to break it or anything, but it's still, yeah. Hey, this is great. It's probably it's probably not that much fun getting into the driver's seat of a Corvette, you know, or whatever. Uh, well, I was <laughs> fortunately for me, I was big with muscle cars, and in fact, I was like a Mopar man back then. You know, if I wanted to come into a place, Gangbusters, and a number of things, I'd pick Mopars for it. My 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 favorite discreet car was a '68 Chrysler Newport, and that thing was bulletproof. The body, so there was that, that, that seriously thick Detroit steel, 383 Hemi, uh, been bored out more and everything like that. This car, when it took corners, it hardly leaned. Uh, 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 it was a big car. It was like a tank. Had a couple dings in it from bullets. I didn't t 